Okay, hey everybody. Uh, welcome to this SSH SIM series webinar. Today's topic is on cleaning and dis disinfecting in SIM uh, and dealing with all of the implications of what used to be uh, a little bit more routine task now that we're here in the midst of COVID-19. We are thrilled to welcome our three uh, guest presenters today, William or David Shablak, William Belk, and Katie Max Kenzie. Uh, they have been doing a lot of work in this area and we're thrilled to have them with us today. Please post your questions in the chat. We will do our best to keep up with your questions and get those to our presenters throughout the presentation. And uh, we are recording this so that it is available to you and your teams after the uh, webinar has concluded. We do offer CEUs for this webinar and we will be sending out information on how to obtain those uh, later on. Um, and within a couple of weeks, you'll get an email about how to access your CEUs. And then Kathy, I just wanna say this, um, in order to get your CEUs, you have to register through SSIH.org. You can't just watch the Zoom link afterwards. Yes, we do need to have you registered and we'll keep those links open, right, Christina? Yeah, they're open for another day, so May okay. 1st. Okay, great. All right, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to David, Katie, and William. Thank you so much for being here. So guys, I'm William Belk. I'm a clinical education manager for Methods Corporation. The majority of my work is done in simulation as far as critical care paramedics and nurses. So a lot of pre-hospital work, uh, air medical industry. Uh, we've got Katie Max Kinsey, who's the Sim Center Manager for Alameda Health. Katie, I'll let you and introduce yourself. Hi all, I'm Katie Max Kinsey. Um, I'm from Alameda Health System in Oakland, California. We are a county hospital system uh, with a level one trauma center. Um, and yeah, we have remained open throughout this whole process. Go ahead, David. And my name is David Shavlock. I'm Sim Operations Specialist for um, Orbis Education, which is part of Grand Canyon Education. Uh, I work in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, in an accelerated BSN program and uh, kind of help out with three different sites, but uh, my main site is Cincinnati. Thank you for having me. All right, so before we get started, I just want to point out that none of us are epidemiologists. Uh, we do not normally work in infectious diseases or work with, the, with this kind of uh, patient population. We basically fell into this. So we started talking a few weeks ago, said, what can we do to help out? We started studying this, and the next thing you know, people were asking us questions. So I in no way claim to be an expert in this field. It's just simply saying this is the information we found. We've backed it with a lot of research, uh, and we wanted to share it with everyone else as, so basically you can see where we're coming from. Uh, so basically just getting started, learning objectives. I'll let you guys read these yourselves. I'm not going to read slides to you all day, um, but basically we're going to go over what it is that we're facing right now, what are the risks that we're dealing with, and how can we mitigate those risks as well as cleaning and disinfecting our SIM centers, what is working, what isn't working. So first things first, hand washing. Everyone who's been in healthcare from day one of nursing school or EMT class or medical school, Hand washing is the number one thing we can do to prevent the spread of disease, and coronavirus is no different. The number one thing we can do is continue to make sure we're keeping clean. You'll notice the pictures here on the right, which I stole from a very, very reliable source called the Daily Mail. So uh, what that is, it's basically showing the glow germ, the hand washing of different time intervals, and then if we have to use hand sanitizer. Uh, so written in front of you is the instructions that we should also be following, but then more importantly, the statement at the bottom. If hand sanitizer is the only thing you have available, then it's appropriate. However, if soap and water are available to you, you need to be going through the whole process. Uh, and you can see that in the pictures. Hand sanitizer just does not have the same impact. So cleaning versus disinfecting, these are both CDC definitions and they're very, very long definitions, but I broke it down very simply. Cleaning is washing away with soap and water anything that's on the surface. And this includes the majority of bacteria or viruses. Disinfecting is when we double we spray something or wipe something on that's actually going to kill what's left on the surface. So everything should be clean before we actually go through and do the disinfection portion. Know what you're dealing with. So bacteria everywhere, right? I think uh, I read not too long ago, four pounds of the human body are actually made up of billions of bacteria. Uh, so bacteria are single cell living organisms. They self-replicate. Very few of them are actually pathogenic and make us sick. Uh, whereas right now, what we're really focused on is COVID-19 is a virus. So viruses are much smaller than bacteria. They are not actually a living organism. They're genetic material that's wrapped in usually some kind of membrane. This is an enveloped virus that we're talking about right now. And they actually replicate by using the cell machinery that is in our bodies already. So when they infect a host, they go in and they actually copy themselves over and over again using our cells because they're unable to do it on their own. 
All right. So what are we worried about when we go back into our sim centers? Surface survival is one of the biggest debates that I see right now because nobody knows. Is it four days? Is it five days? Is it two days? Is it nine days? And so most recently, this is what I was able to pull from the CDC. It depends on the surface. And so we're talking glass or wood. We're in that four to five day range. Plastics or stainless steel. So those are your countertops. Uh, we're looking at about three days. And then as far as uh, porous surfaces, cardboard, fabric, paper, other things, they are probably much shorter. It doesn't seem to last very long on a porous surface. Uh, social distancing is we're going back in the Sim Center. Katie's going to talk about what they've been doing. They've been open throughout this whole time. I've been open as well uh, on a limited basis. And so basically our address to this is fewer people on the schedule, rearrange our classroom so that everyone's got their own table, we'll space it out. I'll let her elaborate a little bit heavier on that. PPE and participant screening, same approach. Everybody gets scanned on their way in as far as temperatures and then masks and gloves for everyone that's gonna be in the lab. Cleaning, disinfecting between each participant, making sure we allow time to do so. All right, so this one, and I actually stole this picture from St. Peter's Health System in New Jersey. This is the important part. We talk about cleaning and we automatically think of the mannequins or we automatically think of the surfaces that we're touching a lot. But we don't always pay attention to everything else. Light switches, doorknobs, and it's not just the doorknob. If you look at a dirty door, it tends to be head height where we see the handprints. And so making sure that we're thoroughly cleaning all of these facilities before we return to work. Sure, we know that if we've been closed for several weeks, it's unlikely that anything is still alive on those surfaces from when we went out. However, those of us that have been in the centers or out of the centers in that time frame or had a few people that are still working in there, we need to be focused on this. High volume appliances. So this is the stuff that all of us are using all the time. Computer components, keyboards, stuff that we don't normally think to clean, but that many of us are actually touching. And then the medical equipment. It's not just the mannequin. It's the IV pump. It's the cardiac monitor. It's everything else that we use over and over and over again making sure that it is completely sanitized before the next person comes in and uses that same piece of equipment. David, I'm gonna let you take over on the list in. Can I ask a question? Someone's asking, are you providing your own mask to learners or do they have to bring their own? Katie, I'm gonna let you take it and then I'll answer how we're doing it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so because we're a hospital-based system, um, we actually, the hospital is providing masks to all employees at the, as they enter the building. Um, we also have county um, masking guidelines at the moment that require you to wear um, face, uh, some sort of um, uh, face masking. So as you enter into the hospital, you people are wearing their own masks. And then once they're in the hospital, we are actually providing them. So we're getting that through our hospital and we hand them out if they don't already come with one on. And we're very similar. So we provide surgical masks to everyone. They get scanned as far as the minute they walk in the door, we check their temperature. If anyone's got a fever, they turn around and they leave. Uh, and then we provide them with just standard generic surgical masks. However, if they have something of their own that they prefer to wear, they're more comfortable with, we do allow them to wear it. For the hospital base, that's not our case. We ask them to wear for in infection prevention guidelines for the hospital is that it is a surgical mask that is being um, given to them. And then I'll let you go ahead and keep going and I'll save the rest of these for later. We're getting quite a few. Okay. All right, no problem. Uh, so basically, the um, C we used a lot of CDC guidelines in our research, so we were trying to make sure everything was science-based, and uh, they refer to the EPA list N, and so that is a list of um, specific chemicals known to kill different pathogens, um, and it's registered by, by the EPA as things that will kill it. So if you go to the EPA and you look at the list N, uh, you then have to pare that down to what will kill uh, they label it as human coronavirus. So make sure that you're doing that because not everything will kill, um, you know, what you're going for. So you can be specific and targeted. Because um, if you just go on the EPA's list in, um, it's about 30 some pages of, clinic, uh, of cleaners, but then um, it gets down to about a six page list of things that they know will um, kill human coronavirus. This is about 140 products. Um, of the 140 products, uh, they actually, specifically talk about hard surfaces or porous sur or soft porous surfaces. And so uh, interesting thing is of the 140 different chemicals, um, 135 are only for hard um, non-porous surfaces. So you also want to make sure you know what you're cleaning and what you're using those things for. So, um, you know, like it came up um, to use a wipe um, in one of my cleaning sessions 
because it was on the list end, but then I had to pare it down and make sure that that actually would clean or would kill the human coronavirus. So um, make sure that when you're, you know, using the list end, you're targeting to coronavirus as of this point. So when we're talking about cleaning mannequins, um, we ended up going to all the major manufacturers of mannequins. Uh, and then when we were doing some research, we used a resource um, that Nick Brower, um, you made on a blog post for um, Sim Ghosts. And pretty much all the mannequin manufacturers said soap and water to clean and disinfect with 70% isopropyl alcohol. Uh, obviously, when you're doing soap and water, you want to be very, very careful around the electronics. We're mainly talking about the skins and the surfaces that your students are touching. Um, so, you know, you have to decide what policies and procedures you're going to use in your sim centers uh, and how often you want to clean versus how often you want to disinfect. So, uh, I know in my center we're talking about doing cleaning in morning and evening and then we're doing disinfection between every student group. Um, there was one thing that Laird all said is that you can uh, submerge CPR face masks and things like that. Certain you know things can be submerged in a uh, sodium hypochlorite solution which is a bleach solution. Uh, the biggest thing that all of them agree on is do not scrub the mannequin surfaces. Uh, if you scrub the surfaces you'll actually abrade the surface giving little spaces that contagion can get in and you can't clean that out as well. So um, you don't need to use any harsh abrasives, cleaners, um, things like that. Mainly soap and water clean and the 70% isopropyl alcohol to disinfect was what they all kind of agreed on. When we're talking about electronics, um, one thing that uh, Will came up with was a lot of your um, places will have disposable or wipeable covers. So things like LCD screens and stuff like that, you can't use most cleaners on the LCD screens because it, it will just degrade them. Um, so you wanna make sure, you know, if you can get them, uh, make disposable or purchase disposable and wipeable cleaner or um, covers for, you know, touch screens, keyboards and all things like that. Uh, most of the electronic manufacturers say, you know, something with a 70% isopropyl alcohol solution. Um, when we're talking about isopropyl alcohol as well, um, there's a lot of um, higher percentages out there. And so you'll see things like 80, 90, 91, 99%. Um, really the 70% is key. You want to stick within that frame because if it's higher percentage, that means it's gonna evaporate off quicker and it's not gonna have the contact time or the dwell time. Uh, and that's another big point is when you're talking about your list N and your EPA um, list N and your cleaning chemicals, you wanna go by their guidelines and go by the EPA's guidelines for contact time and dwell time. So you wanna make sure that you can leave it on the surface visibly wet for the amount of time that um, they recommend. So, um, but yeah, with the isopropyl alcohol, you wanna make sure that it's 70% so that water content allows it to stay on the surface visibly wet so it won't evaporate off um, before it can actually kill what it's trying to. Uh, don't use the bleach and things like that. You wanna make sure you use something that is electronics uh, capable. And David, there was a question in the comments I did see about touch screens because I put in here not to use alcohol or abrasives. The, the most basic way to, uh, to attack the anything on a touch screen is with basic soap and water. Do not allow pooling of the water on the electronic device itself, but that is just standard cleaning is the advice from most manufacturers for touch screens. Uh, and so you cannot use alcohol, you can't use bleach on most touch screens, but you can use basic soap and water. Just don't let the water soak into the device itself. Uh, when we talk about VR headsets, so I know a lot of us are using VR technology either in our personal lives or in the sim lab. Uh, Really, the, the, the true answer is we shouldn't be sharing them at this point. Uh, however, I understand that if we're using it for simulation, there's going to have to be some give and take where we're actually using the device between different people. Uh, and so I think the best thing we can do at this point is use a disposable cover, if at all possible. They're very inexpensive. You can buy them by the hundreds for maybe 15 bucks on Amazon. I'm sure there's other places we can get them from. There's a picture of them right here. Uh, and then after that, you're going to use a disinfectant or an alcohol solution on the soft parts of the container. So wherever it's meeting the face, any of the fabrics, but you've got to let that dry entirely between users. So if we are using a VR headset and say, I'm going to use it for 15 minutes or whatever to run my scenario, and I'm going to give it to David, it needs a good 15 to 20 minute drying period between that to make sure it's not being damaged and that we're not passing that virus from one person to the next. 
Do not use anything abrasive on the lenses for obvious reasons, but more importantly, you cannot use UV light. UV light will actually go through the lenses and burn the screens that the image is being projected on inside of those headsets. Uh, and so you've got to avoid anything that's going to damage it. It's the same reason you're not supposed to take these things outside and play in the sun and you're supposed to keep them indoors. And so just the most basic, try and use a cover whenever possible, but absolutely leave yourself time to clean them between users. When we looked at list N, um, we, we broke down the primary ingredients for a lot of them. So when you're trying to find a good cleaner, um, they, it, you want it to be on list N, but these are the primary uh, disinfectants that people are using. The number one was quaternary ammonium. It's not just standard ammonia. So don't just read that and think it's ammonia. No, it's actually a sterilization um, chemical that is in most all of, I think it was 65% of the items on list N that uh, would actually disinfect against uh, coronavirus was carotinary ammonium. Uh, the biggest thing with all of these cleaners is use your manufacturer's guidelines, have good ventilation, use your PPE and things like that. Because with carotinary ammonium, it is an intolerant risk and um, you know, it can really damage skin and it can be thing, you know, have problems like that. So it works really, really well, which is why most of the cleaners use it, but you gotta make sure you're being safe also paying attention to the dwell time or contact time of how long. Some of these cleaners, it's up to 10 minutes, so. And I'll add to, when we talk about quaternary ammonium, you see it a lot in disinfectant products, uh, but specifically for coronavirus, it does seem to work because the coronavirus is an enveloped virus. However, quats are very, very unlikely to work. So they have a very low eff efficacy against non-enveloped forms of virus. And so if we're talking about something else or your concern isn't specific to COVID-19, you need to go to that list in and double check and just make sure the chemical you're using today is the same thing that's going to be facing whatever threat we have three, four, five weeks from now. As most of these guidelines we're, we're giving you are focused towards our current risk and current problems. But again, all of the practices are good and adaptable to anything that'll come. Another one is sodium hypochloride. It's basically the primary component in bleach. Um, it's the easiest, most prevalent to get. Uh, you know, bleach is a lot easier than some of these other cleaning chemicals. Uh, you know, right now trying to order most of the cleaning agents is getting harder and harder because we're all ordering at the same time. Uh, the nice thing is uh, CDC recommends one third cup of bleach to one gallon of water should give you that 1,000 parts per million. So it's easy to make uh, and it has a short con contact time. It's only a contact time of one minute. But again, this is for hard surfaces. This is for your countertops, your, you know, things like that, but you have to test it. You have to make sure it's not gonna damage because I will say certain uh, mannequin skins, the bleach is gonna eat it up. It's gonna discolor it. It's gonna be a problem with it. So again, you need to make sure you're looking at what you can use it with and what you can't. But um, it, it's pretty much the most prevalent and easy to make for a variety of hard non-porous surfaces. Another one, it was uh, kind of number three on the list was uh, hydrogen peroxide. So sometimes people are able to find that and not so much the bleach or the um, specific, specific chemicals and things like that. Uh, we were trying to find a good contact time on the list end. It didn't really, um, it, it said the time, but then we got some other references that said different times. The number one thing with hydrogen peroxide is uh, the household hydrogen peroxide comes at about 3% solution and you can just spray it on and leave it. Uh, we recommend uh, 10 minutes because then you can just let it dry and wick off and that sort of thing. It doesn't need to be wiped off later on. Isopropyl alcohol, we talked about already. Um, it's got about a one to two minute uh, contact time and, and it's getting harder and harder to get. But the biggest thing I want you to know is uh, if you find 91, like in the store for a while, I was able to find 91. So I bought it all up. Uh, you got to use a little bit of math and that sort of thing, but get it down to that 70% solution. You don't want to use it in the 91 because it's going to evaporate off way too quickly and um, it's not going to kill what you're trying to get it to kill. All right. And then we're talking about UV disinfection. So this comes up a lot. I've heard a lot of questions, especially within the last few weeks about well, what can we use UV light for? Uh, hospitals have been using UV light to disinfect rooms for some time. So there's definitely a lot of information out there about the use of UV. The important thing to remember is that the way it works for one is it basically goes in and screws up the DNA or RNA. So it messes with that genetic material that prevents the replication of the virus, which is good. So then we stop at one, we don't allow it to replicate. However, there's some risks. And so the big risk being anything that's not in direct light, in direct UV contact, 
has a lower instance of actually being disinfected. It's not to say that it won't work at all. It just doesn't work as effectively. Uh, and they see this in hospital rooms, especially when they put in a portable UV light and rooms like the bathroom or the closet don't see the same level of disinfection that you get in the primary room because that light's being deflected off of other surfaces. Uh, and so if we're talking about disinfecting a piece of equipment, a lot of our equipment has knobs or it has ridges or it has bumps. Anything that's in those shaded areas or those shadowed areas is going to be difficult to truly disinfect and that light's gonna have to be moved around several times in order for it to work effectively. The other big, big issue with anything UV is the UV rays that we're using to disinfect, UVC, in, in our everyday life tends to be filtered out by the ozone. So we don't get that exposure when we're out walking in the sun. UVC itself can cause burns to your eyes, burns to your skin very, very rapidly. Talking about seconds, you can have a sunburn from this. It can cause lasting damage to your eyes. And so being very careful when we're using this to wear safety glasses or to avoid direct exposure, there, there's a lot of things that UV is good for, but there's also a lot of risks that have to be known above and beyond even the risks that we use with different disinfectants. And then Katie, you might go yeah. over, but someone was asking, can you go over how long from start to finish it takes to clean one room after a student event? Yep, definitely, I saw that. Thank you, Christina. Um, so we have uh, remained open doing both in situ and in, um, in our simulation center. Um, throughout this. Uh, we're not there every day, um, but we've definitely uh, put hundreds of people through simulation in this time. So I just want to talk about some of the challenges we've come across. I don't necessarily have the best answers for everything, um, but I just want to get you in the frame of mind of these are things that you might, if you're not already open, you might need to start thinking about of how you're going to have solutions. Um, so next slide. Thanks, Will. There we go. So um, one of our biggest challenges has been um, communicating which d disinfectants to use on which surfaces. Um, and I was extremely thankful when David and uh, Will went ahead and put this podcast out with their one pager, which you'll see on the next slide, um, because it helped for me to dive through all the um, questions that I had um, and kind of really start to knuckle down um, plans. This has evolved for us throughout this process. Um, what we were doing at the start, it looks very different now to what we're, um, what we're doing. And we're actually at the point where we're starting to look at our regular um, scheduled programming coming back um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and so we're really wanting to have a nice solid plan and communicate that plan out to everybody. One of the things that we had to look at was the frequency of cleaning and disinfecting the sur surfaces, as David mentioned earlier. How often are we doing this? Um, who's doing it? Um, and uh, at what point do we, like how much do we need to build this into our schedule? So someone asked that question, how long? We have been allowing about 15 minutes per between learner groups if we have two people available. One person wipes down the, uh, the debriefing rooms while the other person uh, wipes down the simulation uh, rooms. Um, and we've actually also looked at having two lots of equipment where the stuff that, um, so things like BVMs, if we're reusing them, because that's the other challenge is a lot of these, at one point we were down to three ventilator circuits in the entire hospital. Um, and so when we were wanting to run vent training, we were very aware that we didn't want to be reusing our uh, vents and we didn't want to be disposing of our vent circuits every single time as much as I would like to. Um, and so there were things that we were having to reuse. So we were looking at having um, two lots where we can have one that we can clean while the other one's in use and then swapping out in between. But we've been allowing about 15 minutes. Our centre is about two and a half thousand square feet to give you an idea. Uh, and we're also talking about our numbers uh, have significantly reduced. So so we have now limited our sim center to 10 people total in the entire two and a half thousand square feet. And we have specific room limit at numbers um, for our room limits. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Another one of our um, challenges, like everybody here, even in a hospital, has been managing our supply of limited cleaning products. So I was saying to David and Will earlier, we were, um, 
we were actually having to use disinfectant wipes on our mannequins when we were very early in this, where we were running in situ, we had our mannequins in clinical spaces um, because that's all we had access to. And we knew we were doing, probably doing damage to our mannequin skins, but we had to weigh up the, dif uh, the differences between, uh, you know, the difference between using the, the ideal and what we actually knew would at least kill Corona, even if it was doing damage to our products. Um, with our in situ, we've actually, um, any time that equipment gets loaned out or we take it into the clinical space, we actually then bring it in and put it in quarantine uh, for seven days. Um, and it sits in the part of the sim room that doesn't get used. Um, and we, and that includes the tablets, the equipment that goes with it, everything. Um, the backboard that the mannequin gets transferred on, et cetera. Um, we have had to secure our PPE and our cleaning products from what I'm calling incidental loss. Because we've been there sort of part-time, um, we've found that sometimes we go back and that container of uh, disinfectant wipes, that definitely there were some when we were last there, are now missing. Uh, so we've had to, um, we're in the process of actually setting up a staging area where we can clean. We have three simulation rooms and we're actually talking about turning one of our simulation rooms into a staging room where we can have it dedicated to cleaning um, and disinfecting our products. Um, and then I talked about um, our quarantine for our insight you and being alone. So I want to show you some of the stuff that we've developed that helps us communicate uh, all of these um, all these issues. We have had to develop the signage. We've developed a facilitator guide to help with the infection prevention aspect of it. And we've been collaborating with our um, EVS, so our housekeeping. Um, we've been with materials management, with our purchasing to kind of, um, we have limits in the hospital as how much we can take at one time. So for example, we can only get one box of surgical masks at a time. Um, anything more than that, we have to get approval from the command centre. Um, we can get one container of um, wipes. So we've had to really balance um, that challenge up. Um, and we've had supply issues where um, EVS has recommended us to use a particular soap when we're using our um, soap and water, uh, but we're no longer able to get that. Um, and so we're having to adapt uh, to our best possible scenarios and be as flexible while kind of trying to maintain um, our infection prevention. We've uh, asked our infection prevention team to review um, these documents that we're in the process of finalizing. Um, and we have referred to the simulation community. Uh, so the little picture down in the um, bottom corner there is of the one page um, handout that Will and David did up that has been absolutely invaluable for us developing. So on the right, um, we've worked with our hospital. We've taken their social distancing, their masking, um, their screening um, requirements, and we've adapted that into what that looks like for our sim center. So we've broken it down into what the sim center is doing. So the learner knows that we are thinking about this, we are being proactive about this, and then what they can do to assist um, us. So they, and we've had to, with this, we've actually had to enforce things like universal masking, uh, where people have walked in and they haven't had masks and they don't necessarily want to put them on. And we've had to say, but this is our policy, we need you to do it. Um, and so enforcing that has been um, interesting. We um, try where we can to maintain that social distancing, but knowing that when they're doing a hands-on simulation, they they do get a little closer than six feet. And so we make sure that they're performing their hand hygiene before they walk in and they're wearing gloves and masks when they're in the rooms. Um, if we go on to the next slide, this is our facilitator guide that we have. Um, so it's a two page. One is just going into a little bit more about 10 people total, including facilitators, staff members in our center. We came up with that number by basically doing the math of six feet between all our um, spaces. We then um, mapped out our sim rooms, how many um, people we can have in that and our control rooms by doing 
um, by doing the math of what six feet is. That's how we came up with these numbers and we've said 10 people total um, with the exception that, you know, if you're in sim room um, one, there'll only be four learner, four people in there and the, other, the others will have to watch via live stream. Um, we've talked about how to clean um, common surfaces, um, the, that we have removed things like our um, water cooler, our candy jar. Um, we've taught our le learners to come in and open up the candy jar as soon as they arrive. We've removed that. Um, and we have placed tape down on the ground to help people realise where they should be um, standing. Uh, masking guidelines, gloves, hand hygiene. And then we've done up a step-by-step -step for our mannequin cleaning of this is the exact process we want you to do in order to be able to clean and disinfect. One of the things to think about is linens. Um, what is your process going to be around linens? So we've actually um, removed our bottom linens on our mattresses and uh, to make it easier to clean the surface. And then we replace the gown um, and or sheet, top sheet over the top for each learner group that comes through. Because we have such tight time turnaround times, we've struggled with that linen um, to be able to change an entire bed between each of the learners. Uh, so they're the sort of things that we want you to kind of take into, into the guts. Um, yeah. um, so I think that's most of the big, big things. I'd love to dive into, uh, you know, Deb, Will and I talk about we're not experts. We've just kind of done We've dived in, done the research and tried and been evolving. So we'd love to get into some of these questions. So Christina, do you have a list for us? I'm sure I see the chat box going crazy. So. Katie, are you going to be able to share your, your uh, information? They, they all want your uh, posters here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will I will get them out. They're just in final review at the moment um, with our infection prevention team. So once they give us the blessings, yes, definitely. But they are on the slides. Um, but I can share the actual ones once our infection prevention team says. So one of the questions was for non-hospital-based centers, who's doing the temp checks? And the next one was, how do you safely clear a one or clean a one-way mirror? So the temp checks, I know that we're looking at non-contact thermometers um, because only because of cost, simply because those probe covers and things like that get very, very expensive over time. So I know that's what we're, um, you know, my, my team has been uh, coming up with, um, not my team, the team I work for, um, they're doing that. And as far as the one-way mirror, it depends on the coating. If it's just the glass, you should be able to use any sort of, um, solution that list n says is okay um but uh yeah off the top of my head i don't know because my my initial answer would be a bleach solution but i don't know how that would haze or anything like that so you just want something that is uh approved on list n do you know of anything will yeah so what we've done is we've used the non-contact thermometers as well they look like a little gun so it's a little bit aggressive to put that in somebody's face but we'll we'll actually scan the forehead as they come in do body temperatures and then anything above normal. So anything above 99 degrees, we're done. And they, they go and they come back on a different day. Uh, my Sim Center concept is a little bit different than most. And so I, somebody said for non-hospital, we are absolutely non-hospital. I have, I have five or six training centers spread out throughout the entire country. And my people travel from all over the country to get there. And so for us to turn someone around is as aggressive as that is, they may have flown from Idaho to Phoenix for me to turn around and send them right back home. Uh, some chat box asked earlier, does them being a febrile mean that we're safe? And the answer is absolutely not. Uh, a lot of these people, and potentially the majority of COVID-19 cases are asymptomatic. Uh, even, even the ones that do eventually start to show symptoms are sometimes walking around already having respiratory concern, 88, 89% pulse oximetry for days before they start having difficulty breathing. And so just because the temperature is good does not mean that we're 100% safe, but it is one more step between us and them and trying to do what we can to filter those people out. And then I may have missed this, Katie, in your mm -hmm. handout, but do you use a specific screen tool for screening participants? And you as well, Will? Yes. 
So that's done by, we're lucky where that's actually done by our hospital. Um, what I would recommend is the CDC has updated their website um, and they have an amazing reopening guide. Um, David's holding it up there. We can put the link in um, the chat for you. Um, and it, go, it has links. It, they actually even break it down. We've reviewed um, a lot of the main documents, but we haven't reviewed a lot of the links because there are a lot of them. Um, where it'll actually break it down to if you're in a healthcare setting, for university colleges, for um, uh, community events. These are the things they recommend in order to be reopening. And so that's a great, great um, resource um, that we have um, available to us on the CDC website. So we'll put the, we'll put the um, link in the chat shortly. Um, and another, so, mm -hmm. another question I think is about fabrics. Do you have curtains in your sim room? Are you taking these down and then carpet? So, you know, this is a great question. I think, um, I think if you talk to any infection preventionist, they'll uh, tell you that curtains are the most dirty part of the hospital um, because they never get clean. Um, we personally don't have um, curtains, but it's definitely something to think about whether, do you need those curtains? Uh, can you take them down for this period? Because how are you going to clean them? Um, and it's one extra step. Um, the other thing uh, to think about as well is along the carpets. Um, so for us, we are here to the, we're adhering to the rest of the hospitals. You know, we're no different to the rest of the hospital in terms of infection prevention. Um, and so this brings up a great point about us working with our EVS. We've actually seen, um, and who's coming into your rooms to, to do that sort of cleaning and disinfecting. We have the advantage of having a trained crew um, that know how to clean. However, they have been so overwhelmed and our EVS is actually extremely short staffed at the moment that they have had to prioritize the clinical areas to clean. Um, and so we actually haven't, uh, we can't rely on them to be coming down and cleaning in the sim center. We can put requests in for the carpets to be cleaned. We do vacuum, um, but it's one of these things that we just try and adhere to the normal um, hospital infection prevention for any other common area because we don't have PUIs or confirmed COVID positives, which then put it into the isolation uh, precautions that then lifts it up to um, very specific ways of cleaning it. And then I see David. Um, yeah, one thing, I don't know if I mentioned or not now, but um, so of those 140 chemicals on list and that will um, kill COVID, um, remember, five of those are for soft, for soft surfaces such as fabrics, but only as a laundry pre-soak. I'm not going to put my desk chair in there as a laundry pre-soak. So honestly, I don't have a really great solution. I think I know what I'm going to do, but I, I'm trying to research. You know, we got to think about the, the carpet, the desk chairs, the things that we touch, we sit in and, you know, deal with that are not laundry something that we can actually, you know, launder. So that, that's a great point. And then another question is, what are you doing for in situ when you have to go to the hospital? How are you cleaning there? Yeah, so uh, it's just as simple as we give it a wipe down um, with what we have available to us at that point. Um, so we don't always have soap and water available to clean our mannequins with um, when we're in situ. Um, and so we have actually, a lot of the times we've been using our disinfectant, um, our hospital grade that are approved for killing Corona, um, knowing that it's doing damage to our mannequins. Um, but we'd rather take the, we'd rather take the, um, that, uh, damage. Um, and then when they get back to the simulation center, it goes in quarantine for seven, seven to 10 days before we use that equipment. So we're very aware of what we send out into the hospital for in situ, that that is going to be um, sort of out of commission. Um, we did have a period where we were, we have multiple hospitals and we were transporting between multiple hospitals. Uh, and we left our mannequins in the car um, in between um and locked up our cars in the garage um to and then kind of said that well this car is now dirty um and so we'll take our kind of like precautions around that um because we had to think about that transporting aspect of it as well 
um, and knowing that we did our best for, for disinfecting between each. No different than we do in the, the center. We try our best to disinfect between each learner group, um, knowing that we're maybe not being perfect all the time, but we do our, our best for that. And then there was another question about BLS and mask, but it looks like quite a few of the attendees have answered that for Terry. Um, and it looks like um, Will also responded about clinicians wearing masks. So I'm just scrolling through. If I missed your question, just type it in again and I apologize I'm quickly. Um, what are your thoughts about running, about participants or faculty 65 or older participating or running the Sims? So I'll, uh, oh, go ahead, Katie. I, I didn't no, see no, your answer. No, no, you go, Will. You go. So I don't, my, my education staff, I don't have anyone in that at-risk age group um, that normally travels with us and runs simulation. I do have employees, clinicians that come through for their exams that are in age group. It has not come up as an issue yet. Uh, and primarily because my clinicians are still out there flying every day. So they're still working. They're at a much higher risk taking these patients in a helicopter from one place to another than they are traveling across the country even to come to our labs. Uh, and so we haven't had any real concern about that age group or those, those more at-risk people, uh, primarily because it's a smaller population for the, for the group of people I work with, but also just because they're, they're already going through so much more just in their day-to-day -day activity that when they come to the sim lab, it's a very, very low risk for them. Thank you. And, and, then and I, I, would, I would add to that, defer to your institution's HR policies. Um, so there are a lot of leaves out there for people who fall into that category that they can choose to take leaves or, you know, allow that to be de dealt with um, at your institution level, not necessarily at your specific level. Um, get your guidance from what the institution is saying. Um, we shouldn't be creating those policies ourselves. Um, so yeah, go to your, go to your institution um, and ask them how to best handle that. Then sorry, Heather, I know I missed your question. Do you have a monthly, weekly, daily cleaning disinfect disinfecting regimen? If so, what does that look like? Uh, not at the moment, but maybe we will. We're doing it as needs at the moment because we've got such a low, uh, a small volume at the moment um, in comparison to usual. We're doing it at, at the start of the day, between sessions, at the end of the day, um, and then repeating that process. Uh, but moving forwards, as we get bigger, we're going to maybe have to look at. At the, mo at the moment, we're doing probably the deepest clean we've ever done ever full stop in our simulation center um, and so that idea of doing daily you know weekly monthly um, at the moment we're just treating it all like it needs to be scrubbed hard and long um, every single day um, with it but I think moving forwards so that's definitely something sustainability wise we need to take into consideration and then for um, Katie and Will, who's still doing Sims now, how do you keep six feet during Sims and skills training, like big, like vent training? I can, oh, I can answer that one. Go ahead, I'll answer after you. Look, we've set the room limits um, and we're trying to put them in the room and sort of, you know, not have 10 people all standing on top of each other. And then within that, we're also aware that um, we are not going to be able to keep six feet apart while delivering healthcare, full stop. Um, and so we're making, we're taking out as much prevention as possible to reduce the risk of things being transmitted um, by wearing face masks, by having them do hand hygiene, wear gloves in the room, disinfecting in between learner groups. Uh, we're trying to, um, we're trying to maintain that social distancing, um, but we're aware that in that, that sim room, it's just, it's not going to be an actual, you know, reality. So. And, and very, very similar on our end. We, we limit the number of people in our sim room to one educator and one clinician at a time. Uh, of course, we the control next door. So the second person who's running simulation is separate by you know an inch of glass or whatever. Uh, so what we're doing is just minimizing the number of people in the room. We're requiring the mask, the gloves. We do not require gowns because all of our clinicians come in and they just like you guys put scrubs on in the hospital, they put a clean flight suit on and then that flight suit gets washed when they're completed. 
And so one, I did see your question about proning and there's absolutely no way you're gonna keep six feet of distance uh, doing proning simulation. And so if we're gonna be training on those procedures, we're gonna to have to be hands-on. And the answer is simply don all of your PPE that's available to you. You're gonna to have to find a way to source it, maybe borrow it from the hospital, um, but you're not gonna be able to do any kind of proning training other than watch a video without and maintain that six feet. And to that, we've been um, we've been sort of deferring to um, what the hospital requires PPE wise at that point in terms of um, you know isolation um, sort of PPE. Uh, so if that person was you know is a PUI or confirmed, they're going to be wearing X PPE. Um, but often things like in the emergency room, they are not treating it as everybody being a PUI. Um, and therefore, they are just wearing gloves. It's just just standard precautions as well as a face mask. And so we're trying to, we're not treating ourselves as any different to the hospital as much as I would like to have everybody fully, you know, as protected as possible. We can't have a double standard to what the hospital is teaching that in these, in these moments, um, you have to use this PPE. And then with regards to PPE, is it disposed in biohazard daily? Um, we don't, we are just in the trash and then trash gets taken out um, with it. Um, and we are trying to keep that being daily. That's one of our challenges is that our EBS is so overwhelmed. That is something that we potentially have to do um, with it. But yeah, we're trying to take it out daily. And then it looks like this is a popular topic and people want more. So I'll reach out with the presenters at a later date, but thank you all for that feedback. Um, has anyone been laundering face mask covers with bleach, the cloth, the cloth covers? Oh, David, The only thing I was going to say to this point, um, I have not had any instances of this, but the only thing is, like I said, if you know, um, you want to make sure that if you do think you've had contacts, you want to use something that is on the EPA list and that is also certified for pre-soak. Now, right before I came on here, I tried to find one of those chemicals, try to source them. And as Renee, uh, my sim boss said, is that um, you know, it's hard to find. So you've got to try to go out to as many of these vendors and try to find it from, you know, Katie and I were talking about this right before is it's mm -hmm. getting harder and harder to find it because we're all out there trying to find it. Um, so I know the CDC says, you know, wash with hot water uh, and that will do, you know, good. But if you think you've had contacts, make sure you're using one of the sanitizing chemicals. There, there are five. So that even makes it harder. But uh, you want to do that for the, the um, pre-soak. And then do you think you'll need to replace your equipment and tech much sooner from all the additional cleaning and disinfecting increased chances of electronics going down? I think it's something we definitely need to have in the front of our minds that um, th this may shorten the shelf life of it. Um, I don't think it's necessarily going to do it tomorrow. Um, just be aware that bleach is the one that we've really come across um, as being something that does deteriorate things quickly. I know I saw it in the chat box and I know for us at our hospital, um, bleach was being used on the pappas and the pappas just started falling apart like within two weeks of people cleaning them with um, bleach. So that's one of the ones that we have come across as being really careful with that it will do, that, that it will deteriorate things quickly. But yeah, it's definitely a consideration. Um, and then correct me if I'm wrong, someone asked, what do you do if a learner's temp is scanned when they enter the, their building, but they don't go to the Sim Center for two hours? How are you guys handling that? So we scan them at the time of the simulation. So when they walk into the sim center is when they're scanned for us. So I don't, there's no delay. It's when they come in right away. Katie, is that the same for you guys? So ours is they get, our staff get scanned upon entry um, to the hospital. So at the start of their shift. Um, so it may be that they've been on shift for eight, nine hours before. And we, we just don't know um, with it. We're not adding, we're, as I said, we're going by our institution's guidelines as to what that looks like. Um, and so I'd really, whether you be hospital-based, you know, university-based or somewhere in between, um, I'd really recommend that you get your input from your institution as to what they consider to be their best practices that they want to be seeing. Highlighting the fact that, look, we, we cannot deliver this education without people being in close contact. 
So we may be the exception rather than the rule to the rest of the institution. So can you please help provide us with guidance? You've got to work with the institutions on this. I know one thing my organization's talking about is in a part of our logistics of scheduling, we're going to be only scheduling an, a certain amount of people. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to find out exactly what that number is, um, but whatever your organization comes up with, that's all that's going to be in the building at that time. So we're going to get very, very good at logistics, and that is planning your mm -hmm. cleaning time between, planning when people are allowed in, you temp them, you run your sims, and you, you got to go. And so we, we are not opening any sort of uh, congregation areas or anything like that. The only people that are going to be in our building are the people doing this, or at least in the SIM center, are the people doing the SIM. They're going to do their SIM. They're going to do their debrief and, you know, using the PPE, um, and, but still do appropriate simulation because when they're doing this for real, they're not going to be maintaining six foot distances. And, you know, you've got to do whatever your um, organization, you know, is going to approve, but... Uh, those are some of the conversations we're having at ours. And then this this is recorded. It'll be posted later today. If I don't get to all your questions, I'll email them to the presenters. And the chat is published in the recording. Sorry, I see a lot of this. I wanted to get to that. Next question. Do you have any recommendations or considerations for protecting patient actresses in SIM when not using mannequins? We've said no. Uh, we've said no to standardized patients of any sort. Um, so, and this is a battle that we're fighting at the moment with our stroke education. Um, they're one of our biggest advocates that they, um, and they, every two weeks they're down doing simulations. Um, and we're like, well, your option is to use a mannequin. Uh, we know it's not ideal. We know it sucks. Or to look at some sort of other option, such as watching a video and debriefing the video. Um, or we could do a Zoom if you want to do a Zoom. Um, but they all the options are not ideal options, but it's just, it's not at this point, it's not worth having that extra exposure. And in fact, our institution doesn't allow at the moment, isn't allowing, um, it, many, even like, uh, uh, vendors on site. Um, so there's that, you know, there's that aspect there of we couldn't even get them in the building if we wanted to, cause they've locked down, um, all the entrances, they have to go through screenings and the hospital security would turn them away. Do you use reusable supplies like IV infusion bags and tubing? And how do you disinfect? Yeah, that's a great question. As I was saying before, we this is our one of our like areas of the, our gray areas that we ideally we would love to use all new equipment every single time. Um, but we know that there are supply issues around especially things like vents, ET tubes, um, you know, any of that respiratory equipment. Um, ABGs is a big issue. Swabs for the testing are a big like supply issue um, around the nation. And so we're kind of trying to work that balance of, um, of reusing. Um, we're wiping, we're soaking. Um, as I said, we're actually looking at setting up a staging room where we can basically, while a sim's going on, we can be cleaning and disinfecting um, the other set of equipment and then flipping um, in between um, uh, and then sort of getting rid of it as regularly as we can within being responsible for um, the supply chain. David? This could be another one that you've got to really go on whatever your organization says. But, um, you know, again, this is not my organization speaking because we're still making our plans. But I would go back to the bleach solution because you can run bleach through those, um, the bags, the lines, and soak them. Uh, and remember, the contact time, visibly wet contact time is a minute. So I remember in my last institution, we would soak them overnight and, you know, just to make sure. And this is before we did any research on this. And uh, you know, this sort of thing happened and um, it, it seemed to work for us. We didn't have the science to back it up. Now that we've done the research and the science, that's probably what I would, you know, start researching if, if your organization will accept that. And then another question was, how much time does this cleaning add to your work day? A lot. <laughs> yeah, agreed. <laughs> Just a, a lot. After um, every question. <laughs> Yeah, as I said, we are going in early. We get in, the first thing we do is start disinfecting, cleaning, uh, and then we're building at least 15 minutes. Um, you know, for example, we trained 100 
uh, nurses in free 12 hour days um, where we normally would have been able to get them through in maybe a day, maybe two days. And we had to do it in three because they had to come in small numbers. We had to build in turnaround time. We had um, two of us cleaning at once. Um, so it's definitely a lot. And then the other thing that I forgot to mention um, earlier that kind of plays into this is you're going to have to start thinking about your workflows. Um, so for example, we've removed a lot of our tables and chairs from our debriefing room, but we have no storage space for them. So where do they sit? Um, at the moment, they just kind of get shuffled around. And so we need to find a permanent solution to that. Um, and that all kind of goes into you're going to have to, we are going through our schedule for the next kind of three months um, to start with. And we are basically essentially scrubbing it and starting again and saying, okay, this four hour class is now an, an all day class. Um, as simple as that, um, just to be able to get through it. So, yeah. Flexibility. Well, we're at the five minute mark, so I just wanted to talk about a few quick resources before I ask the presenters for their final thoughts. Um, SSIH.org, we have a COVID-19 resources page where all the recordings and some helpful resources can be found on topics like this. And if you want to register for any future ones, we put the link in the chat box for the webinars page. And um, I talked about the SOTS open forums that happen every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, these lovely presenters are on those calls. So if you have any further questions for them, this is a topic that comes up every week. And other than that, I wanted to give the presenters the time to close it out. And we're really grateful that you offered to present. And as you can see in the chat box, people really appreciate your input and would like as much more as you can get. <laughs> well, so, yeah, well, 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 thank all of you because like we said earlier we kind of fell into this this was definitely not some crazy exciting topic that we were super excited about to jump into uh and it has been just extremely overwhelming the feedback that we've gotten so we really do appreciate you guys we appreciate everyone dialing in just to catch up today as well so thank you so much yeah thank you cannot say thank you enough the other thing is feel free to reach out to us um you know we're, we're definitely out there in the industry we're out there on social media and this and that uh, if you get questions, we are there to help you. Uh, you know, the thing I always say is together, we're always stronger. So I just want to make all of us better. So just please feel free to reach out. Katie? Yeah, and I just, I'd echo that um, we're all learning um, at the moment. And I cannot be um, a big... I cannot shout out enough to the community around us. Um, it's been invaluable. Look on your SSH forums, jump on the Facebook groups, uh, social media, ask the question. And I then also say a big thank you to those people who actually put their resources up. Um, if you are able to do so, they're always invaluable. There's a fantastic one going at the moment on um, uh, simulation online 2020 as a Facebook group and uh, shout out to I believe it's Kate Nick, uh, Nicholas um, sorry if I got that wrong um, who's put up an amazing reopen opening document um, and discussion going on with that so it's things like that that are just invaluable that all help us help each other yeah I love that because um, that what I was able to do is we're, we're making our own documentation for organization so I completely grab that we're cross referencing it and I'm trying to get the permission to post stars so as we all so none of us miss anything uh, also don't forget we're going to put up the links to the new EPA got or the CDC guidelines for opening uh, America and, and all that and we were Good digesting a lot of that before uh, you know just before this call because it just came out uh, last couple of days. So, but yeah, a huge thank you to all of you. Can you say the name of your podcast? Cause you can talk about how you have that, especially the cleaning one. Cause we did link it on our page. Good. Um, yeah. So uh, we'll uh, go for it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the Sim Geeks podcast, it's available just about everywhere at this point. If you find somewhere it doesn't show up, feel free to let us know. Um, and there is an episode specifically dedicated to cleaning for simulation. We brought in Nick Brower, who's the VP of Sim Ghosts as well, because of a blog post he'd written. Uh, Dave and I were doing a bunch of research on this topic. And in the midst of all that research, he posted something. So we just called him up and said, hey, do you mind joining us? Go over what you found as well. Yep. Great guy. We were uh, hoping so to get we were pretty much anywhere. You find us Instagram, Twitter, everything. Yep. I put the link up but in the chat because it's amazing. 
Thank you. I, I, yep. don't, I don't work for them. I don't get anything from it, and it's been invaluable. So and we don't get anything. We're, we're not sponsored. We don't get a dime for it. Like I said, the only thing we, we do this for is to make all of us stronger and better. So by all means, interact. We know, we want to know what you want to see and, and what you want. So thank you so much, everyone, for attending. You'll receive an email from me from the education in, inbox regarding your CEUs in about a week or two. And if you have any further questions on any of these, just email education at ssih.org and we can connect you with the proper resource. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks, everyone. We appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.